and welcome to episode 33 of Radiant Reflections. My name is Josh Harma, joined once again by my co-host Ryan Bibb, who's going to talk now. Yes, thank you for ah, telling see. me <laughs> what to do when you say that. I'm learning. I'm learning, ladies and gentlemen. Who's going to talk now? That's right. Yeah, on a side note, is that center camera like super close on us? Uh, I mean, it's maybe a little closer okay. than we're right. normally. It's that's wider. all right, that's okay. all right though. That's all right. right. No. It's probably yeah. picking up like just how if I look like a zombie. If you're watching the video version of this uh, and I look like a zombie, I'm I'm tired today. I am too. I said right before we got on, I could go home and nap. But I heard it said one time, sometimes that's the most spiritual thing you can do is Take just nap. nap. Mm-hmm. Just rest. Did Garfield come up with that? <laughs> no, it's some like... <laughs> Did you ever watch Garfield or read those comic strips? Yes, he was always napping. Yeah, he was uh, napping or, or eating. eating lasagna. Yeah. 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 So I don't know if you could make the lasagna spiritual, but oh, you can. Oh, can you? Okay, you can make food spiritual. <laughs> so Garfield was really passionate about napping and lasagnas. What are some things, Ryan? <laughs> as we, as we talk about the last episode in our series reset, where this past Sunday you talked about resetting our passion. What are some things that you are passionate about? And you don't have to necessarily be like spiritual here. You can be, but okay, you you, you don't have to be. No, that's good. Uh, I'm passionate about sports. I love sports. Uh, almost all sports. I will watch basically anything. Yeah, I'm just a sports fanatic. I love sports. I love coaching sports. I'm passionate about coaching. I love especially coaching football. That's probably my favorite sport. Very passionate about coaching football. It's probably, yeah, my favorite sport to coach. Um, But I I love coaching my kids, coach my son. And this year I get to coach my son in football for the very first time. He's never played football. We always said wait till middle school. And so now he gets to... Uh, play football, and I get to coach my son for the first time in football, but I've also coached my son in baseball, which is great. I love being there with my son. Baseball's not the most exciting sport in the world, but there it is. I love coaching my daughter in soccer. That's fun and stuff. I'm passionate about that. I am passionate about yard work. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Straight lines. Green grass. (laughs) Yeah, you... Landscaping. I I take a different approach, but... (laughs) I'm not what were you going to ask me? Uh, I was going to ask you, so when you coach your kids, are you easier on your kids or harder on your kids compared to the other kids? Or do you think you actually, like, you treat them just the same as every other kid out on the field? Um, I would say a couple of years ago, I was probably a little harder on my kids. Uh, this year, just the most recent example is my son being in football. Um, I've, I've uh, maybe it's because I know it's his first year playing the sport. So I'm a little more grace-filled, hmm. or maybe I'm just maturing. I don't know what well, it is, but I am go. more grace-filled with him, even though he's going to be a starter. Um, I'm just correcting little things. So I don't know. I, I, the, one, the one greatest advice I got with coaching, though, is um, you're a coach on the field, but as soon as you walk off the field and get into the van to go home, you're dad again. Hmm. And I have to learn that because oh. I still want to coach him on the way home from school to the house and, and stuff. I will coach him when he asks for it at the house. But other than that, as soon as we walk off the field, I'm dad again. Not so you coach. don't like, you don't like walk into the living room and like, get down and give me 20, son. <laughs> yeah. I guess that'd Let's be work on like... that stance again. No, like if he asks or he knows, Hey, we need to work on the stance. We'll, we'll go home and we'll work on the stance. But there are times where, Hey, I got to stop being coach and I'm dad now, yeah. which is hard, but it's a lesson learned and it's great advice. And I'm, I'm growing and maturing in that area. Cool. So, hey, for any of you parents out there that are also coach your kids, uh, there's some uh, free advice from Pastor Ryan on that this morning. But uh, so we finished up our recess series, and you talked about this, this idea of passion. Now, I think a lot of us, when we, when we think passion, we, we might have emotional uh, things in mind, right? Like, oh, like this is something that I'm excited about. When you're talking about passion in a spiritual sense, how is it an emotional thing and how is it more or different than just an emotional state? Oh, like I'm passionate. I feel this thing. Mm-hmm. How, how is it different? Yeah, well, let's talk first. It, there is an emotional piece to it. Um, I, <laughs> I watch Michigan football because I'm a big Michigan fan. Well, I haven't yet this year because they don't play until, you know, 28 more days or something like that. Not, uh, that, he's, not that he's counting down. <laughs> yeah. But there's an emotional piece. So when I'm watching Michigan play football on the te- television, I am passionate about Michigan football, and I will be emotional when we lose. I mean, my wife will know when we lose, I'm not a happy camper. 
So this, which this seems is, irrational. I get that, but I'm emotionally tied to be like, this is dumb. Like we should have never lost. I'm sick of losing to Ohio State. Like I'm tired of that, but there's expect. But like, this shouldn't even be a game. Why are we losing? So you, you you're gonna have to help me understand it because I have two brothers who are big U of M fans, right? And they're the same way. My older brother and and Aaron, if you're listening, I'm sorry, I just, I'm picking on you, I guess. But I mean, he would he would lay on the couch and he would throw his shoes Absolutely. at the TV. Absolutely. Like if, if a ref made a call he didn't agree with. Yep. Uh, same, like like my younger brother, like, I mean, his emotions could be tied to if they won, like, oh, things are good. And if they lost, yep. like, oh, my goodness. It's, yep. like, it's, like town, it's like, man, like, you're not even on the team. Like, how is it that you're emotionally affected by because this? Because you're passionate for it. You, your heart is tied into it. Like I can literally walk, I will walk out of the middle of a game and my attitude just be so upset because we're losing, it's the fourth quarter, there's no, I'm done with this and I walk away and I'm upset. Okay, so this is an interesting thing though. So, so we might think of passion as, as, as a positive emotion, but you're saying because of your passion for this thing, that is also what leads to more, you know, what we might consider negative emotions. It could, or it could be literally I have irrational passion towards Michigan Wolverines okay. football. <laughs> <laughs> that could be as well. But we're, we're passionate about our kids, too, where our emotions are tied uh, to our kids as well. So there is a sense that your emotions do get tied to this word, this idea of passion. But it's not all there. There's a spiritual aspect to, the, to this idea of passion. Um, and the spiritual tie-in is this. We, our heart has to break for what breaks God. There's a spiritual tie-in. But not only does our heart break, because if our heart breaks, if God's heart breaks for lost people, our heart should break for lost people, and we should have a passion or this fire inside of us for saving the lost people. Flat out, that that should happen in the life of every believer, every follower of Jesus. There should be some sort of angst, some sort of uneasiness or passion to say, I have lost family, family, neighbors, friends, coworkers, classmates that I need to get Jesus to them. So there's a spiritual aspect. But the spiritual aspect, too, is if we are fully, if Jesus literally is Lord and Savior of our life, if he is sitting on the throne of our life, on the throne of our heart, we ought to be passionate about who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We ought to be passionate about the, the Savior of the world that saved us from our darkness of our sin, and now we get to spend all eternity with him, and we are saved, and we can be forgiven, and we know we're loved, and we can walk in freedom. There ought to be some sort of literally idea of passion and surrender to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So there is a spiritual tie-in. It's not just all emotions, but the spiritual aspect does come in, and they play hand in hand. They play well together. Okay. So in this message, and for those of you that haven't heard it yet, you can go to the radiantlife.church slash media to uh, listen to Reset Episode 3. Um, but you use the passage uh, where Jesus uh, makes this declaration about the, the Holy Spirit coming, living water, which tied into this festival. And that was the passage that you camped out on. I want to look at some different passages as it relates to this idea of, of resetting our passion. I want to, I'm actually going to, for those that are listening or watching, I'm actually going to read these passages. The first one is in Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to just read verses 1 through 5. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. 
that is wowzers. <laughs> so, right, I mean, initially you're like, all right, he's right, he's got some good things to say about the church in Ephesus, yeah. which for those of you that are listening or watching, uh, there's a lot we can learn about Ephesus. There's a, a oh, book yeah. called Ephesians uh, that Paul wrote to a bunch of different churches in Ephesus. You have uh, First and Second Timothy, and Timothy was uh, uh, learning under Paul, and he was actually the pastor at the church in Ephesus. So we, uh, we can learn a lot about Ephesus. Uh, but here you have you have Jesus saying to John, the disciple, um, they've done some good things, but I've got a bone to pick with them. Who also, <laughs> by the way, John, this disciple, ended up being an elder at the church. I mean, he goes to Ephesus, according to church historians, and John is part of the church in Ephesus. So you wonder if this was like a little bit of like a heart check to John to be like, like yeah, uh, was this... that's my church, bro. <laughs> so... Get this. What's interesting, too, this is just coming out. I didn't realize that. It's the first, right? Uh, we know Jesus is giving seven warnings to seven different churches. Mm-hmm. It's the first church he goes after. Hmm. Just curious. Just, you know, and John was a part of that church. So right. I don't know if there's any correlation. I just huh. realized, wow, that's the first church Jesus actually goes after. So lest, lest John be sitting there and get get a big head thinking, oh, hey, right. he's going all these other things. At least my church is yeah. okay. <laughs> Your humility <laughs> and pride is going to get crushed in this moment. Now, I want to read, uh, I was reading through a commentary by Pastor Tony Evans, and he, and he has a, a couple of comments on this passage that I thought were, were really cool. He says this, They had correct doctrine, but not a correct heart. The key word here is first, not love. As with the romantic love between a man and a woman, first love always involves passion. Yet there was not a passionate pursuit of an intimate relationship with Christ in the church. They were merely following a program. Duty had replaced devotion. So we see this picture of this church while they're doing some good things. They've they've kind of, like you talked about in your message, they've let that passion die. Yep. Talk a little bit about how this might happen in our lives. How do we go from, you know, being fired up and, and ready to go, ready to take on hell with a squirt gun, as, as you'll sometimes say? How do we go from that to this place of, of a passionless, kind of mundane, heartless, like just going through the motions? You could have just stayed with Tony Evans' quote, and that could have been our podcast. <laughs> Like, but 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 we want to know how we get out of that. Yeah, because I mean, that's I read that yesterday. And I was like, I was like, whoa! Like that that blew my mind. That I mean, w- they had correct doctrine, but not a correct heart. Um, they were merely following a program. Duty had replaced devotion. We get there at times. It's my fear within the church, the the capital C church, the world, the Christian church as a whole in in the world, is that we become too programmatic, us as followers of Jesus. Especially for those, and it's a trap for those who have been following Jesus for a while, that this is just what I do. It's duty, it's obligation, and we forget the heart behind it all. Um, I think there are two causes that we get there, that we literally will forsake our first love. Number one, I think self-sufficiency. I think we're literally like, I'm good. I got it, right? Um, I just need some coffee, um, my car, give me my iPhone, Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu, whatever. Like, I'm good. Uh, It's self-sufficiency. It's just there. And so we begin to put life almost on cruise control thinking, I I, I just good, you know, um, I think the danger with self-sufficiency is this, though. You may have worldly wealth, but you are spiritually bankrupt. Mm. That we just are, I'm okay, and life is just, meh. And we just go through the motions because we become self-sufficient, and we have not died to ourselves to re- wake up every day and say, God, I need you. I need you. I need you. I can't do this anymore. But I think another thing is, um, I think the second thing that gets us there is that the distractions of this world are great, even greater than they were 10 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm afraid 
where our world is going to go with even more distractions 10 years from now, I feel like the pendulum has swung so significant to all this tech and stuff. I'm, I'm slightly hoping the pendulum shifts back to a, a less distracted techie world. I mean, I think technology is here to stay, but it right. may not be everywhere. They may be, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not in Silicon Valley. I'm not a tech guy. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but here anything. we are on our iPhones and our MacBooks and our. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the distractions. Yes, we like Apple products. <laughs> yes, very much so. No, we are not sponsored, sponsored no, we're not by sponsored Apple. We're not sponsored by Apple. Yet. Um, I think the distractions of the world, here's what distractions do. It'll choke out the word of God. We get so distracted. And that's why we become so self-sufficient. Because there's so many things. And it's like, why, why do I, where, I, I forgot about God. Why do I need, I, I got everything, right? But again, it's empty wealth. It's worldly wealth, but we're spiritually bankrupt in the midst of it. I don't know exactly everything that's happening in the church of, in Ephesus, what's going on. But the thing is, they neglected and forsaken their first love. And so can we. We can become so prideful, self-deficient, self, why do I say deficient? I want you to be well, self-deficient. We are, we are deficient when we're <laughs> self-sufficient. There okay. you go. Um, we become so self-sufficient. I got it. Right? We've got the same. Pull your stuff up by your brute steps. No. How about not? How about Holy Spirit come and fill me and empower me because I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. Those type of things. So self-sufficiency and distractions, I think over time, can just literally, if you will, push God from number one, first love, and he comes second. Now he's third. Now he's fourth. And I think it comes sneakily. I don't think it all the time just bam, and you realize, oh, God's not first anymore. He's like 21st. I think it's the sneaky stuff, the small distractions in life that just move God from number one to number two to number three. And when that happens, We've forsaken our first love, and we put it on cruise control, and we just become programmatic. Which I want to jump ahead a little bit, because actually um, I want to talk about one of the other churches. We also see in Revelation 3 uh, a letter to the church in Laodicea. And, you know, you talk about wealth, you know, being, you know, materially, materially? Is that a word? I don't know. Materially wealthy. Uh, Revelation 3. Start in verse 14. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So you talk about this distraction, right? He's saying, hey, uh, church in Laodicea, you're, you're super pumped because you think you're, you're, you've got it all. You have wealth. You're self-sufficient. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they've misplaced that passion, you know, similar to what you're saying. Yeah. But are we going into that? I, I, I do want to go into that, and then we'll bounce, we'll bounce back to some of the others. Because <laughs> you know, okay. I do think uh, there's one question in particular I want to get at. But uh, Church in Laodicea. Yeah. Unpack. Let's you get, like, take a few minutes to be a, a, a Bible nerd, right, as, okay. as Kinsey would say. Right? Unpack, for those that are listening and watching, why in this passage <laughs> geography matters. Yeah. So if you're watching... This podcast, I have my phone. I'm not texting. I'm not doing anything. I have my notes for this question. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Um, So we went to a conference several years ago, and there was a a female speaker. I don't know if she was a professor or pastor or something. Um, I think she was a prof somewhere. um, And and her whole... Her whole takeaway every time she spoke was geography matters. Exclamation and, point. Yes. There's always exclamation point. <laughs> in order to really also help understand the biblical text and the biblical narrative, we got to jump in and understand the land because land matters. This is a significant passage in scripture that we have in God's word that geography matters. Exclamation point. 
Okay. So let's back up. Let's understand the city uh, and the church of Laodicea. As Pastor Josh read, it was a wealthy city. 35 years earlier, before John writes this letter, um, gets this revelation, uh, it was destroyed by an earthquake. And they rebuilt it. And there were massive, beautiful theaters and stadiums and lavish public baths and shopping centers. I equate Laodicea to like Las Vegas or like Dubai. Like wild, but wealthy. Massive, beautiful things. Like they are just com- people in droves are coming. They have incredible wealth and affluence there. Major problem. Inadequate water supply. Their water supply stinks. They cannot get the right water into the city, right? And so why geography matters is there are two cities nearby the city of Laodicea. One to the north, west, north. Is that, that's how you say that, right? North, west, west, north, northwest. North, 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 northwest. Okay, I I meant east. (laughs) (laughs) But no, northwest is not the right. It's the north, <laughs> just just a tick of northeast, just a shy of north, right? It's right there, 10 miles away from Laodicea is a city called Heropolis. Now, Heropolis is known. You can sit and stand in the middle of Laodicea and see this city. It is known for its hot springs, okay? 10 miles away. Heropolis, hot springs. Now, 13 miles to the east, slightly south of just true east, is Colossae. Now, Colossae is known for its cold water. It sits at the base of a mountain, so all that cool river water or mountain stream water flows right into the city, and they're collecting it. They're smart, right? And they've got the cold water. Uh, So, 10 miles north. The hot springs are right there. Like people are traveling in the ancient world miles and miles and miles to go to Heropolis because of their hot springs. 13 miles to the east, you've got the best cold water coming down from the mountain. And Laodicea is right there sitting there going, and we have horrible water supply. So what does Laodicea do? They sit there and say, we got to tap in to Heropolis and get the hot water. And we have to tap in to Colossae and get that nice, cold, refreshing water. And that's what they do. They build aqueducts, tap into the hot water, tap into the cold water. And obviously, um, we know um, both cold water and hot water have a purpose, right? Cool is refreshing. Hot is medicinal. And by the time the water goes to Laodicea, what was happening was that hot water from Heropolis, just 10 miles north, It was hot coming down through the aqueducts, but by the time it hit Laodicea, it's lukewarm. It's tapping. By the time that cold water is traveling 13 miles east into Laodicea, it became lukewarm and dirty. Now we understand the language when what God is saying to the church Laodicea. Right, because, I mean, really, I think for a lot of years, you know, growing up as a kid, as a teenager, in, you know, into, into adulthood, I would read this and I think, oh, so this passage is saying it's actually better to be far away from God. Yeah. You either want to be on fire for God, hot, or far away from God, like yeah. you don't even care about him, nothing. It's better to be that than this lukewarm thing. Uh, explain to our listeners and watchers why it isn't that. That isn't what this... <laughs> no, because, <laughs> as I said... Saying. The water, both water has two purposes. Cool is refreshing. You know on a hot day, you drink, I mean, I've got a, right here, ice cold water. It is so refreshing and good, right? Mmm. Mmm. As I take a sip, right? (laughs) It's cool. It's refreshing. It's good. But we also know when aches and pains, it's good to get into like a hot bath for medicinal purposes. So both sets of water have purpose. As followers of Jesus, we ought to bring hope and healing like hot water to people, but we ought to be cool and refreshing also to people. But also just in general, we have a purpose that we have to choose to live into. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole warning is, hey, Laodicea, you're lukewarm like your water supply. And Jesus literally in this this passage is saying, I want you hot like Heropolis or I want you cold like Colossae. You decide. 
Because lukewarm, what you're doing as lukewarm, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. You can't stay there. <laughs> I love, that's one of my most favorite passages in all of scripture <laughs> because geography plays a huge role because you were right. Growing up, I, 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 same thing. It's like, oh, I got to be hot. I got to be on fire. No one, not cold, far away because cold represented far away. No, it does not. Mm. Ge- when you understand geography and then you get into the biblical context, the story just blossoms and it becomes so beautiful. Okay, so let's let's backtrack just a little bit. Um, as we talk about this idea of hey, you know we've we've fallen into this. You know, we're doing things out of duty rather than devotion. Um, we're we're all about programs. We're not about passionate intimacy. Uh, how do we know if what we're experiencing is is a normal ebb and flow? You know, sometimes in, in church world, we'll use like this. Oh, you've got like your mountaintop experiences and you have your valley mm-hmm. experiences. You know, there's 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 some give and take. How do we know if if what we're walking through right now is that normal mountain valley rhythm versus being in a place where we've we've let our passion die? Mm-hmm. We've we've blown out the flame to you know to use that yeah. illustration that you used on Sunday. So I, I would say this. Do I still want to get into God's word? Do I still want to pray? Do I still want to be Jesus and represent him well in church world? We call it witnessing, right? Uh, Do I still want to do those things? Do I still want to continue fellowshipping and going to church and worship with my family? Um, do, do, Do I still grieve at sin? I think those are good self inventory questions to ask yourself because if that all those are like, Yes, I still want to be in God's word. Yes, I'm still in his presence. Then you know what? You just may be in the valley of life right now or the wilderness or, or whatever. You're there. But if it's like, dude, I haven't picked up God's word in six months. Like I realize my prayer life is just, it's non-existent. Then I think, okay, there may be some spiritual indifference here. Man, I think the fire went out type thing. So I think those, I would go back to, honestly, and I, and I just thought about it, I would go back to spiritual disciplines. Are they still there in your life? Are they there? Do you still have the passion and desire to still get into God's word to try to hear from him? Or now are you just going through life? Yeah, I think those are self-inventory checklist to understand the difference between, yeah, maybe I'm spiritually indifferent and that flame is now gone. Or... I'm just going through a rough spot, but my desire is still hearing from God and, and being in his presence. Right, because we're not saying that, hey, if, if you have your passion still intact, you're never going to have a bad day, you know? <laughs> Which right, is, you right. Know, I mean, because we know that, you know, all throughout Scripture, we see that that God uses wilderness experiences uh, to grow us. Absolutely. So, yeah, so it's not saying, oh, hey, if you're, if you're going through a bad day, oh, your passion is clearly gone. You know, God doesn't, He's not happy with you because you're not passion. We're not saying that uh, at all. So yeah, I know when I went through a dry spell several several years ago, like I I went back and um, I never wanted. I realized for me personally, this is why I do the self inventory checklist. I didn't even want to have quiet time, my own quiet times anymore. Mm. I just wanted to go throughout the day and just not and realize, wow, I wasn't praying. So maybe that's why I say the self inventory checklist because no, I didn't want. There was nothing there. Now, when I'm in a valley, here's what my desire is still get, because I still want to hear from God. So I try to still, and I will push myself to sit there and go, I need this quiet time. And for me, my quiet times are always in the morning. Um, try to, before family wakes up, I try. So even in my valley, I'm like, I still want to hear from you, God. I'm still going to try to get in your presence. It's mm. good. Uh, so as we look at these, as we wrap up here, um, we looked at these two churches, Laodicea and Ephesus, and to both churches who had gotten off track uh, with whether it's, you know, their passion is misplaced or, again, in Ephesus, you know, they've just become very programmatic. Uh, the call to both churches is to repent. Mm. Uh, take just a few minutes to unpack what repentance really means. I think some of us, we sometimes have ideas like, oh, well, like repent is, uh, I just, I go and say sorry. Like if I do something wrong, I go and say sorry. There, we can sometimes blend uh, confession with repentance with, and we kind of mix a few of these churchy things up. 
Uh, and if you want to go down the route of like the Mike Breen, like Kyra, you know, how he differentiates repent and, you know, whatever. Totally up to you. Totally up to you. Uh, but unpack what repentance means. I, I, I think you brought up a good point where we do cross. There is a little crossover, but I feel like we've crossed over. We've blended them too much. This idea of repentance and confession, because there are there again, there is some crossover, but they are two separate um, words with meaning. The idea of repent is literally think of a U-turn sign. That's what repent is. It's I am turning direction completely. I am one hundred percent walking this way. I am walking north. And to repent means to turn direction. And now I'm walking in the complete opposite way. I am now walking due south, right? That's not, now confession comes in to understand. Now I got to confess, God, I was walking due north and I'm sorry. It's the confession. I've repented. I've turned away from that. And now I'm walking due south. And that's, that's the difference. What Jesus is trying to do with these two churches with the idea of, hey, you got to repent is, Stop. Stop going that direction. Stop putting me out of first place anymore. You have forsaken your first love. Stop that and turn around and come back so I can be number one again. Stop living into your own wealth and being lukewarm because your attitude stinks and I want to vomit you out of your mouth. You have to repent, make a complete turnaround and come back to me so I can get you either hot or cold, whatever, be medicinal, refreshing, whatever it is. Um, but repentance, it's, it's that. Again, I, I always picture the U-turn sign. You're doing a complete U-turn. You're going this direction. I'm not doing that anymore, and I'm walking in a completely different direction. And I think that's the key. It's a completely different direction. Because you could be walking this way and say, I'm not going to do it, and just take a little bit. Take a, take a little right. And be like, oh, I repented. See, I'm not doing it. But no, you're still, there's still some attitudes and habits there. You have not repented. A repent is a complete change of direction of where you once were going. Right, because I, I think sometimes we, we can look at even, you know, we can even take scripture. You look at like uh, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we look at that and say, sweet. So we mess up. We do something stupid. And we're like, oh, hey, sorry about that, God. But then we, we keep going and we do it again. We're like, oh, hey, sorry about that, God. And we're like, oh, hey, this is great. I'm confessing it. Yeah. He's forgiving me. I must be okay. Right, uh, and we, and we which fall is, into that. Which is great, which is confession. But we would say you have to fully repent of that. Right, so, there's, so that's that one of those differences uh, that is important. Uh, the church in Ephesus can't just say, oh, hey, sorry about that, Lord. But then they keep living just out of duty and, and programmatic thinking. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's that, like you said. You got to turn around and then start walking uh, the other direction back towards yeah. Jesus. So. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm a visual learner, so I hope those that are watching and listening get that. When you think of repentance, think of that big, giant, yellow U-turn sign. Because the U-turn is always the complete opposite direction, right? So, yeah, that's what I, it's an easy illustration there for you. Okay, so if we, just in, uh, in closing, if you want to boil all of that down, right, to somebody who's listening, they're like, you know what, I've realized my passion has waned, or it's been misplaced. What is like a, a, a practical, and you've given some, so I mean, I just, this is kind of like review and, and reminder. Like what is a practical next step for them to take? And they're saying, my passion is gone. I want it back. Now what? Now what? You run away. You run away. I was going to my notes. I, okay. I was like, I have, what question did I just ask him? Because I didn't think that. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to reiterate what I said in my message, but um, I'll give you, no, I'll give you a, other that. little nuggets. But it's, um, I truly don't think someone wants passion back until they fully surrendered. Don't want it? Okay, unpack that a little bit. Because what if they said they want it back, but, but you're saying... You may want... So I would say, that is that re, do, really? Do you? So you're saying if, if they're not willing to surrender, yes. they don't really want it back. I would say I just want to make yes. sure that I'm, that I'm yes. talking with you. Because I have, I have 
even for myself, so I'm not just speaking for people that I've interacted with. I will say this even from personal. Do I really want that? Yes, but I'm not willing to give these things up. So I'm not all in. I think when you go all in and you really want that fire again, you're going to go all in, which means I will surrender anything. I want it all. And so I think that's your first step is, God, where have I not surrendered that I need to surrender so I can have that passion and fire again? Because I think when the passion and fire and the flame comes back, you desire deeply in the depths of your soul to go all in. I am 100% sold out to you, Jesus, 100%. And so that means no matter what had caused that flame to go out, I need to give that and surrender completely over to you. And I think I know um, maybe it's just what the Lord's doing with our staff or here at Radiant Life or whatever, but I think a big thing is, is you got to get into God's presence. <laughs> Sorry, I say that laughing. <laughs> That's for you, Brandon. <laughs> um, there's so much truth, though, there is I don't think ever we'll get the fire back and the passion back if we're away from the presence of God. you got to enter into the presence of God. I think when you're in the presence of God, not only will that fire go, but I don't know if that fire will ever want to burn out again. And if we're not in the presence of God, ask the question, have I become sold out to just becoming programmatic? So we could, we could even do a throwback to our, our Dangerous Prayer series. Um, and you know, one of the, I think it was the last prayer that we did in that series is search me, mm-hmm. right? Hey, Lord, search me. Is there anything in me that I've, I've, I have a passion for? I've misplaced it. You know, like the church in Laodicea, it's wealth. Maybe for you it's, Something else. I don't know. But you have to take time, like, like Pastor Ryan is saying, in the presence of God, letting Holy Spirit reveal those things to you, and then taking steps of repentance, <laughs> turning around, going the other direction, uh, back towards Jesus. Yeah. But All right. Anything else you want to say as we close this episode out? Let's. Um, I don't. I, I want to close with, um, oh, man, of course I want to close with this quote, and I don't have it. <laughs> um, um, John Wesley. John Wesley's quote, quote on, um, is it about give me a hundred men or anything? <laughs> give me a hundred men. I think, I think there's a John Wesley quote, like give me, uh, give me a hundred men who, who, who fear God, nothing else. And what was it? Something like that. And, and I'll change the world. You know, some, some, quote yeah, like it was that. something about like set me on fire and watch me burn. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what I want. I want, I want. Not just for radiant life. I want every follower of Jesus. Man, if we truly are in the presence of God and that fire is burning deep within our souls, I tell you, man, this world would be completely different. Mm. Completely different if we just got on fire and that we don't allow the distractions of the world to dim our flame. Well, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus and you feel like that passion needs to be reset, I want to encourage you. Uh, take some of those that self inventory that Pastor Ryan talked about. Take some of those steps that Pastor Ryan has just talked about, uh, and and work on resetting that passion. But uh, thank you for joining us here for episode thirty three of Radiant Reflections. Uh, it was a pleasure as always. Absolutely, it's uh, always I, fun. I enjoy it. But uh, we would love it if you guys would like, share, rate, review, subscribe, just to uh, let us know how we're doing. And hey, anytime you have feedback, uh, whether it's positive or negative. We'd encourage you, shoot that to us, podcast at theradiantlife.church. You can send us an email. If you love what we're doing, go ahead and give us a good review. If you hate what we're doing, shoot us an email and tell us why you hate what we're doing. And then you can give us a bad review if you want to. We're good with that too. But uh, thanks for joining us. We will see you guys next time for episode 34.